Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Okay, once again, we get this great privilege to relax and listen uh, to how the Holy Spirit opens someone's heart to a deeper walk with Jesus Christ in his church. And uh, often, I just mentioned to our guests that it's kind of surprising when, when people think about non-Catholic Christians who become Catholic, the first thing that comes to their mind are probably Anglicans and Episcopalians. But the one thing that they all don't think about is that the second biggest group in our database are Baptists. What are they doing coming in the church? Well, such is our guest tonight, Noel Colbertson. Noel, welcome to The Journey Home. Thanks, Marcus. It's great to have you here. It's good to be here. And um, I've only got half of you because your husband is here, but he came in at the same time, right? He sure did. And our kids were baptized and received into the church at the same time. So yeah. thanks be to God. Well, that, that is a, not always the case. Uh, Absolutely. That both in a couple come in at the same time, but that's a real blessing. So let me back away and, and invite you to start us from the beginning. Let's hear your journey. All right. Well, I grew up in a very faithful um, Baptist home. I, we did Bible studies at home. We had Bible study placemats every day at dinner. We had, we had a little Bible study time. And there was never a time in my life that I recall that I didn't believe in God or experienced that in family life. We were very active in our church. Uh, my dad originally started in ministry, uh, but left the ministry for the sake of the family, and um, then just really evangelized in his ordinary life all hmm. through my life. So I, I grew up going to Awana, and I was socially awkward and good at memorizing, so it was an excellent fit for me. And, <laughs> and we and, and I had a very happy home, a very faithful parents. Uh, and my dad had, uh, both of my parents had had an evangelical conversion experience when they were in high school. My dad's family was Christian science and my mom came from a nominally Catholic background. And Ooh, wow. yeah, so they had, both had very powerful evangelical experiences. And so I grew up, hmm. um, I think it explained in the end a lot of my mom's hostility toward the church, yeah. but um, yeah. But it was a it was a good way to grow up. I was very happy, and uh, I went on mission trips. So when I was in high school, I went to Europe to convert all of the people who went to church every Sunday but didn't know anything about Jesus. <laughs> and um, and I was naive, and so I thought, gosh, I know lots of people at my church like that. <laughs> so I didn't think that it was specifically geared to Catholics, which it obviously was. But I went to Poland, this was in 1991, and 25 years later, I was back in Poland with my daughter at World Youth Day to see the Pope. So wow. God is good and brings all things around. Yeah. But that was my growing up. We were, when I was in high school, we moved to Washington State, and I started working at a Christian camp. And my dad had come to Christ at a Christian camp, so it was very exciting to be part of a ministry that had been so powerful in his life. We worked with lots of different denominations, and we had daily prayer with the staff. I worked with the high school students on staff and taught Sunday school at church. And around that time, I met my husband, mm -hmm. and he came. Uh, he had gone to school at Colorado Christian University with my sister and joined the Navy and ended up stationed in our area. So we... So he went to a Christian university. Yes. Yeah, so my husband was a... Well, his parents bounced around in churches, but came from a Protestant background also. But, but he brought together the two of you, both Christians. Uh, yes. Deeply committed as a foundation. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned, uh, it's interesting, your your dad, was, or was it your grandfather who was Christian science originally? Uh, my great-grandparents were Christian science. So my dad's father grew up Christian science, and then my dad, they went from time to time. So it wasn't a very strong influence in my dad's household so much, but it was definitely a part of their family okay, history. Okay, so you have this Christian science background, which, you know, I don't know a lot, a whole lot about that, but it, it's, uh, but it, I don't want to be too negative, but I would say an aberrant form of Christianity. Right. So, you know, it, 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 then on the other hand, you have a, a, a fallen away nominal Catholic coming right. in. So I'm guessing from both of those backgrounds, you would have at least subliminally had uh, not the best view of the Catholic Church brought up. Absolutely. So the, no church that I went to ever really outright said nasty things about the church. However, they would say things like, 
we don't earn our way to heaven like some people do or okay. things like that. So it was always implied that, that Catholics believed things that, that were contrary to scripture, but it wasn't talked about really outright in, in more you know, under the table sort of ways than underhanded. And you would have had a, a lower view of the sacraments. I had no view of the sacraments at all, really. Yeah. I, we, I didn't come from a liturgical background. I was baptized when I was young, but you were not baptized unless you had made a profession of faith, okay. which I did as, when I was six years old. And so, but other than that, we, and we had communion once a month on the first Sunday of the month, and it, but it was not a sacramental view okay. of life. Definitely scriptural Bible emphasis on our faith, that, that all that we needed to know and to love and to serve God was really, we found in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's what we did. And your husband pretty much brought that essentially the same view. Yeah, together. essentially the same view. His his parents were definitely more loose in their beliefs, but he always desired to know God. And <laughs> the only way we knew how to do that was through the scriptures. So yeah. as we were dating, we went to church together. We read our Bibles together and, and did that. We were dated for not very long before we decided we were going to get married and... We were going to get married as soon as he came back from his an upcoming deployment. He was leaving with the Navy, and he was going to be gone six months, and we were going to get married right after he came home. And about six weeks before he left, I went to a doctor's appointment and found out I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I was the good Baptist girl. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't go to parties. I went to church every week. And how could I possibly let this happen? Mm -hmm. And it was humiliating and, and terrifying and and I felt like I'd let everyone down. And in that moment, and I'm sitting there in the doctor's office all alone, and the temptation flashed before me that said, you could just get an abortion and no one would ever know. Hmm. And I was pro-life, and it, sh it shocked me that that thought even entered into my, into my mind. And this was while your husband-to-be was overseas? He was still here, oh, okay. um, but he was at work, and in those days you didn't have cell phones. I had no way of getting yeah. a hold of him. And, and I thought, I have got to tell someone because as soon as I tell someone, as soon as I confess this, it'll be real and I can't pretend like it's not real. Hmm. And so I left the doctor's office and I went right to my sister's house and said, I, I need to talk. And we went out and I told her and as soon as the words came out, the temptation was gone hmm. because in the light of the truth, you know, the power of the lie is in the secret. Yeah. And um, and so a few hours later, I was able to tell Stan, and in the next few days, he told the pastor, he talked to my parents. I wrote a letter to the staff of the Christian camp confessing what I, my sin and asking for their forgiveness. And it was such a powerful instance of that, the idea of the sacramentality that mm. you, when you confess to someone who really has the power to retain their forgiveness, and yet you receive it anyway. <laughs> and, and it was out loud, and it wasn't just, God, I'm sorry, please don't let anyone find out about this, <laughs> which was my Baptist prayer of confession prior, <laughs> but that all of a sudden you have a, you have something that, that really needs to be said yeah. out loud, and, and that the power of the, the truth will set you free even from your sin. And, and it was one of the, the things looking back on my conversion, this powerful instance of how confession made hmm. absolute sense oh. to me when I came, when I eventually came to that, <laughs> was a long way off it at this point. But um, so I found out I was pregnant. Two weeks later, we got married. Two weeks later, he left for six months. He came home from the deployment, and two weeks later, we had a baby. So that was our first year of marriage. <laughs> Lots of changes. <laughs> wow. um, but in the meantime, we served in our, in our church, and my husband eventually became a deacon at our church. I was helping to lead women's ministry. We had a Bible study in our home. And in our Bible study, we started going through the book of Acts. And we we're just ordinary people leading a Bible study, <laughs> trying to grow in our faith and understanding. And we first we're each week we're reading the chapter and we're trying to read the best commentator so we have something intelligent to say and to grow in our faith. Mm -hmm. And yet the commentators often contradicted each other and not just in personal reflections, but in theological views. 
And Our guest is Noel Colbertson. Noel Colbertson. Noel, it's, um, it is fascinating that on the one hand, we professed the, the um, sufficiency of, of the Bible, right. and you would gather with that assumption. Yet it never crossed your mind that even the consulting of commentaries itself right. <laughs> was a bit of a, an oxymoron right. to the, the idea that this is sufficient. So why do I need these other groups? So it's one thing just to even do that. Right. But, then on, but then what you're saying is that in the process of doing it, on top of that itself, you realize they don't agree. And they have, and these are people who have time to study. I, I'm an ordinary mom with little kids, and my husband is flying for the Navy, and we're doing our best to try to reach out to God. Then we get to Acts 15, and of course, as a the Baptist, Jerusalem Council. absolutely. Yep. And yep. so, as a Baptist, we were always trying to get back to that authentic early church experience, and you know, the idea of having a Bible study in your home is is akin to this house worship that they had in the early church. And we reach Acts 15, and you see the early church in action, and it met in council, and it defines Scripture in a dogmatic way, and then sends out letters to the churches that are binding in faith. And you think, well, that's not how my church works. And here we're constantly trying to get back to this biblical, authentic, early church model, and yet it's very far off of what our actual experience is. You know, uh, just jump in there a little bit because that incident, there's a part of that that a, a lot of folk don't recognize that I think is really significant because I didn't see it back then when I was at a similar stage as you and your husband. And, you, and that is that often, you know, here's this council gathered to deal with this issue. Do we, do, do, do Gentiles have to be circumcised first before they can come into the church? I mean, that was the big, that's why I was a consul. And then you have this group of what we call Judaizers over here. So wait a second. No, they got to be circumcised. Well, the point was they were the solo scriptura guys. Right. And they were saying, it says it here. You must. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, well, that was such a huge part of our journey as you begin to look at it and you think, well, they're defining scriptures dogmatically but also in a new way. And, and the people that were looking to Scripture alone were on the wrong side of the church and the wrong side of Christ, it, which it was shocking, really. And, and again, we weren't even on the path yet. And yet we were. We were. We didn't know we weren't on the path yet. And then, a, oh, maybe another year or so later, we were in our adult Sunday school class, and it was a discussion-based group, and the, our pastor was leading us through... Um, the parable of the, the sower, or the seeds and the sower, and, you know, goes through the different types of seeds falling on different types of soil. And he got to the part where that falls on the rocky soil, and it springs up, but when the persecution comes, it withers away and dies. And so Stan raised his hand and said, you know, I know we believe that once we're saved, we're always saved, but this seems to be stating fairly clearly that this there was faith there, and then it died. So how do we reconcile that? And if you're looking to turn a room full of Baptists on you, that's a great way to do it. <laughs> and all of a sudden the room turned on him and we were driving home that day from church and we thought, well, that was interesting, didn't expect that. And yet you're not quite willing to bet your eternal salvation on your interpretation, because what if we're wrong? What if we're just not seeing something? But it was another stone on our road, on our way to Rome. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting interpretation, your husband. I mean, I, I don't often see it that way, but it's there. Well, and, and for by somebody, grace, he was awakened. And, and for this once saved, always saved, you know, background that we came from, it's it's very alarming yeah. because obviously, just like when you read through the scriptures without your Baptist goggles on, you begin to see all the things that you didn't see simply because you were reading them through an interpretive lens, which interestingly enough, you come to realize that everyone interprets scripture yeah. through a lens, only Catholics yeah. admit it. Yeah, one of the problems 
again, I'm just speaking from my own background, but from guys that I knew, that when you're a once saved, always saved, non-Catholic Christian, often you have a hard time with all the actual teachings of Christ. You end right. up liking Paul better than, Absolutely. than Jesus, you know, because of that very parable and other parables like it. You know? Absolutely. And, and the explanation I always received growing up was that Jesus was speaking prior to the crucifixion and resurrection. So therefore what he said, what applied to the pre-covenant, you know, the old covenant Jews, but not to the new covenant Christians. And it was an easy way to slide in to Paul and to enjoy Jesus without having uh -huh. to obey Jesus. So exactly. the Sermon on the Mount. We don't really need that. Yeah. And so, so then a few years goes by and stands on another deployment. And I think this was number seven for us, uh, seven, six month deployment. And he was struggling with the fact that you, the only way to encounter Christ deeper is to know the scriptures better. But as a lay person with only so much time, what are you going to do and how do you know you're interpreting it right? So he picked up right before deployment, a MacArthur study Bible. MacArthur's not um, typically a road to Rome, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there it was. And he picked that up and took it on deployment so that he could deepen his faith and, and be a better um, Christian father for our kids and for, uh, leader of our family. And I ended up partway through the deployment. I got paired up with a gal named Janet on a field trip with my kids. We were chaperoning together and we got to talking about faith and the state of the nation and the moral decay of society and all the things you don't typically talk about in polite conversation <laughs> and got along famously. And we stayed afterward and talked for several hours in the parking lot and just got along really well. And a couple of weeks later, I ran into her at the hardware store and she mentioned, I think your dad goes to our church. Now, my dad had come into the Catholic Church about seven years before this. Oh. I missed that along yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so my, I was an adult. I had little kids and my dad, um, my dad studied more than anybody I knew. And from the time I was a little kid, he was studying, he studied a lot about the Jewish history, the history of the temple, the layout of it, where was Christ looking when he was crucified and all of the connection yeah. um, to the church. and. And when I was oh, 19 or 20, my dad was meeting with some rabbis to understand um, the Jewish sense of the scriptures more. They were non-Messianic rabbis, but he always loved to ask questions. And he said, hey, I'm going down to the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you want to come with me? I said, sure. So it didn't really surprise me when my dad started meeting with a Catholic priest either to ask them questions. He was uh, trying to deepen his prayer life and found a Carmelite parish in our area. Uh, which was recommended to him by another Baptist gal from our par or from our church. And so she was uh, responsible for connecting him uh, with spiritual direction. And after a couple of years of that, my dad entered the church. Wow. My mom was furious. But you keep working on it. You're married and you figure it out. And it was... Um, was not talked about very much. My, no, you, were you still at home in this? No, end? I was an adult, married, had yeah. the kids, gotcha, had little gotcha. kids. Um, so for my dad, I looked at, at it as a very denominational view of things. So people who love the Bible, they're Baptist. People who like liturgy and study are Catholic and people who are charismatic or Pentecostal and it, everybody finds their place. And that was not the view of the other people at our Baptist church. It was devastating to the pastor who had been very close to my dad. My mom openly wept at church uh, at different times mm -hmm. and, and it made family situations pretty tense. But my dad as a sacrifice back to my mom did not talk about it very much to us kids. My dad was very convincing and was able to articulate himself well, so uh, he did not purposely share very much about his wow. conversion process with us. Did that, you think that subtly opened you up to the church because of what he did, or was it just not a non-issue, you think? For you? I would say it didn't put any roadblocks in the way okay. um, for me. I, I would have loved to hear it. I was very open to learning about the faith and, and the practice of it, so it, um, and I knew he was giving that up for my mom. And, and I always thought that was a really honorable oh. thing. And yet I think back, and conversion is such an, 
a grace-filled, exciting time. It was a hugely isolating sacrifice that he made mm. for her sake, which I always thought looking back was really beautiful. And but I ran into so I ran into Janet again at this at the hardware store, and she says, "I think your dad goes to our church." And I said, "Oh, you go to St. Cecilia's? That's great." And I thought this was a brilliant question that she asked, and she said, "What do you think of your dad being Catholic?" And I gave her that explanation, that my denominational view of it, that it was good for him, not for me. And she said, well, what does your mom think of it? And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a touchy subject. <laughs> and she recommended that I pick up a book by Scott Hahn because he converted and his wife really struggled. And she thought it might be something that would be helpful to my mom. And I thanked her for that and headed on my way and finished my errands. And Stan returned home from deployment, and we were getting ready to head out on a camping road trip to get reconnected after the deployment. And I thought, I should stop by the church in town and ask them, where do you find Catholic books? I had never seen a Catholic bookstore. <laughs> I had, I don't think, seen a priest. I had never seen a nun. I just had no connection with the church. My dad was Catholic, but I was completely disconnected um, from that world. And so I stopped by on my own because I wasn't going to ask my dad for help because I thought if I gave this to my mom, she would, it would not go over well. <laughs> so I stopped by the Catholic church and the doors were locked. And I thought, well, then I saw some people moving boxes around the side. So I went around the back of the building and went and asked the lady moving boxes if she knew where I could pick up this Catholic book. And she said, well, I don't have the book with me, but I have a CD by the same person. Would you be interested in that? And I said, sure, I love hearing you know, <laughs> religious talks. And so she handed me that CD. And then she said, well, would you like any others? And I said, sure. We've got a long road trip coming up. And she handed me about 30 Catholic CDs and a Seeker's Catechism and sent me on my way. Uh. So a couple of days later, we're in the car with the kids and we're doing our first trek through the night. And after the kids fell asleep in the back, we popped in the CD for the first time. And we were absolutely dumbfounded because how could we have missed? We, we were not inactive in our faith. We read our Bibles all the time. And how could we have missed Matthew 16 yeah. and Jesus giving Peter the keys? And how could we have missed John 6? It's all so obvious, you know, that, yeah. that Christ is asking us to receive him bodily and yet as literal interpreters of the Bible, we had completely yeah. overlooked it. And so we, like good Baptists, had our Bibles with us, and we got to the first campground and opened them up and thought, well, it is there. <laughs> it, <laughs> right, that's the first thing you want to check. Right? I don't remember seeing that there, but let's make sure it let's is. Make sure, and let's make sure it says the same thing in our interpretation, <laughs> which it does. And, and it was shocking. And so you began to pour over the scriptures with new eyes. And for the first time, you're seeing things that you didn't see before mm -hmm. in, in a way you didn't see them before. You, again, you began to take those glasses off and realize that you weren't just reading the scriptures for what they were. You were reading them through a lens mm -hmm. of your tradition. And even the kind of lens that says Matthew 16, you don't even need to worry about. Right. I mean, you don't even go there because they don't even tell you why. You just don't go there, and uh, or Matt, or John six. You, right, you, you just, just skip it. It just wasn't part of it. You know, if yeah. you have a building campaign, you read Nehemiah. If you, <laughs> you know, you you have things that you go. You always go through the epistles, of course, and and it was just things that we we missed, and so we continue to pour over our our Bibles at every stop, and and we're listening to Catholic teaching all along the way. We're, by the time we finished our road trip, we'd listened to more than 30 hours of Catholic <laughs> teaching on everything from the Eucharist to marriage to contraception. And we were absolutely blown away mm. with what was there. And, and what was there was what we already knew, what we were familiar with, with the scriptures, only we had seen it through a completely different lens. Mm. And, and it was shocking. And because you knew if you pursue this, it's going to mean the end of our, the life as we know it in, this, in the same way. We were very connected with our church. All our friends were from the church. We were involved in ministry. My mom would lose her mind. <laughs> and, and yet, if that's Christ, 
if he's present, if he has founded a church and it is there today, we are obligated to follow him regardless. And, and since we believe so strongly in the inerrancy of scripture, we had to follow what it said. Well, let me ask you, let me interrupt you there, rudely, sorry. You and your husband both love scripture as well as our Lord Jesus Christ and had a view on all those verses that you would have heard in those CDs from these speakers you never heard of before. You don't know them from Boo. What was it about, I mean, because you could probably pick up a CD somewhere by somebody who had interpretation of scripture that you would listen to and immediately you said, well, that's a bunch of hooey. Right. But these guys, there was something about it that you two were finding at least uh, maybe it wasn't completely convincing yet, but at least you were open to it. What was different about what they were saying? Well, I think first off, it's just grace, you know, that, yeah. that God allows our hearts to be opened um, yeah. as we continue to seek Him. And He says, if we pursue Him, if we ask and seek and knock, we'll find Him. And so first off, it's not attributed to us as much as the grace of God, and, mm -hmm. and we're grateful for that. And I think the second thing is that what they said was compelling but compelling in a literal sense, that it, it wasn't reaching for something. It was very plain in, in the text, particularly in Matthew 16 and in John 6, where it talks about the authority of the church and then also the Eucharist. And if those are true, if, if Christ founded a church and it's there, and he gave it the power to bind and loose in heaven, which means it has to be true because nothing unclean can enter heaven, then we have to figure out how to come in line with that and not the other way around. Yeah. And, and one thing I was suspecting uh, is, like I said, you could have had another CD by somebody explaining away those verses. Well, you take a verse like John 6, where it says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you. That's what it says. Right. So you could have somebody taking that verse, but, but explaining it away, mm -hmm. as opposed to, what I found compelling about those same kind of CDs is they weren't explaining it away. They were just saying, this is what it says. Absolutely. And, and it's a completely different experience. All of a sudden you're reading something for what it says and not for what it might have said if someone else was in charge. And, and as you said, as if it threw a lens. Right. It's, yeah. And, and, it, and, it's, and it was very shocking to realize that as much as uh, Baptist looks down on Catholics for following blindly a long tradition, it's exactly what I was doing myself. And I was reading all of the scripture through my, through my tradition, only I didn't realize I was doing it. Yeah, especially that, that whole once saved, always saved lens has to take so many scriptures and explain them away or ignore them. It really just has to. And, uh, and uh, I don't want to be critical of those that are in that theology, but you get caught in it and you just, like your husband has the audacity to even hint at challenging it and And, and, and it explodes. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's pause there, Noel. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to remind the audience that if you're interested in, in reading Noel's story, it happens to be called Magnet of Truth, and it was printed in one of our Coming Home Network newsletters, and you can go to our website, chnetwork.org, where you can find her story as well as many others. We'll be back in just a moment with the rest of Noel's story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Noel Colbertson. And uh, I've rudely interrupted you in your journey, so let's, let's get back into it then. All right, so we get home from our road trip after listening to all this Catholic wow. teaching, and we think, we have, we have to, we're obligated to the truth to continue to look into this. So we begin scouring Catholic bookstores and finding, we found the early church fathers we got introduced to. And at that same time, I got introduced to G.K. Chesterton, who helped my conversion move from merely an intellectual ascent to the scriptural teachings 
to this joyful, ingenious journey mm -hmm. into the wonder of the church and God's creation and how we live this faith out huh. in an ordinary way. And so I began reading Chesterton. I was introduced first to orthodoxy and moved uh, rapidly through anything I could get my hands on <laughs> as we're entering the church. And I'm following his own conversion process through that into the church. And, and his wit and his wisdom make sense to me, you know, that, that the church isn't simply just a dry set of regulations, which I had never felt in my, in, in my history. And yet, you know, as people look at it and go, well, the Catholic church is so dogmatic. And you think, no, Chesterton says in his, his book on conversion, he says, Adam and Eve lived in a garden of a thousand mercies and the one inhibition was the greatest mercy of all. And anything that the church asks us not to do is a great mercy. And all yeah. we have to do is to seek to understand it. And, and I found that such a beautiful um, gateway to understanding mm -hmm. what the church taught. But we're Baptists, so of course we're primarily studying the scriptures and um, and the interpretations of them as the plain text begins to say and the church has interpreted over the years. And so we go for several months on our studying, my husband and I, before we thought we should really attend mass at some point. <laughs> it's, it's so backwards from a sacramental understanding of things, but that's how we came to know uh, the Lord through the Bible. So we, but we knew what a, a wave that would send, a shock wave that would send through our community. So we thought, well, maybe we'll slowly back out of the church and we'll go to mass one week and to the Baptist church one week and just slowly back out of our ministries so it wasn't so painful for my mom and and my sister's husband worked at the church and wow. and it was complicated and so we settled on a date to go to our first mass and at that point I told um, my mom and dad separately um, and my dad gave me a little thing he'd written up on understanding the mass what you were seeing when you walked through and I told my mom and at first I thought well that went better than I expected she was very oddly calm, which within about an hour turned to hysteria. She came back to my house and was shouting and was very upset. Mm. And I said, well, we're just thinking about it at this point. We haven't even been to mass. We're just, um, we're just thinking about it and, and considering coming into the church based on what we've read. Well, we went to our first mass and we sat in the front row because we were <laughs> Baptist and we were committed, which is uh, good and bad. You can see what's going on, but you cannot see what, what is going on. <laughs> you're supposed to do. So it was, and we had, I had never been to a liturgical service before, so I, I'm sure I was left standing when everyone else was seated, but uh, I wasn't super worried about it. And the responsorial psalm came on and it was, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And, and we were so primed by this point and, and understood what the church taught that, that you're seeing the scriptures come alive in a, in a new way and you're hearing God call to you through the liturgy. And following that, the priest gave his homily and he was just a priest who show, beamed holiness somehow mm -hmm. and you could just see it in them. And during his homily, he talked about Cortez and his men coming to the Americas and they got off the ships and, and encountered hardship after hardship after hardship. And they wanted to go back. And Cortez burned the ships and they had to go on. And he talked and related that to the life of faith. And I leaned over to Stan and said, I think our ships are on fire. <laughs> and then came the Eucharist. And we watched as people from every walk of life, every race, every, you know, so many ages and demographics and they all walked up and received mm -hmm. the Lord. And I looked over at my husband and he was weeping. And I said, are you, are you okay? And he said, I'm just watching the room fill up with Christ. And we never went back. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't when you encounter Christ no. present. And it, and it was a singular grace of that. We don't have that at every mass, but but there it was, the singular grace that God had given at that particular moment as we were entering the church. 
and then the firestorm began. Mm. Uh, my mom was furious. She started going to counseling so she could get a handle on it. My mom was not someone who could make nice if things were, um, she, how, however she felt was on her sleeve and, and, and it was a really, it was difficult because we were very close and she thought it was an absolute betrayal for, oh. for us to come into the church when I knew what it had cost her when my dad became Catholic and my grandma became Catholic in between there. And you can discount one person and you can discount two people, but now myself and my husband came into the church and our kids were baptized <laughs> Catholic and now her whole family, she feels, is turning against her. Hmm. And it was a time of, of a lot of suffering and, and, and you, and I, you know, you're sympathetic to, to her because of how she sees things. They, she doesn't see it in the same way. And her experience with the church was through her parents who weren't great examples of the faith. Yeah. And, and you associate things and, and we can't help but do it. And it's a great reminder to us as Catholics to remember that we are that person for other people. And um, yes, yeah, she couldn't even rejoice or at least accept it as you had as a denominational thing. You know, no. it's good for you, Dad, but not for me. She couldn't allow herself to rejoice in her husband's decision and your decision and your husband, your husband's decision and, and say, well, okay, that's, I rejoice for you. You know, this is helping you come closer to Christ. Good. That's good for you. It doesn't have to be for me, but that, she couldn't even get there. No, it was, it was absolutely, if there, if you're once saved, always saved, the one way you can lose your salvation is to become Catholic. <laughs> well, at least it showed that you didn't have an authentic conversion in the first place. Or, yeah. However, that would have been worded. But it was a real struggle for my mom. And we came in at the Easter vigil in 2011. And my did kids, you do RCA and all that? We did. We did. They, um, they offered to fast track us after we met with the priest. And we declined because part of coming in line with the church was coming in line with her schedule hmm. and her calendar. And that it wasn't about just getting what we wanted when we wanted, but entering into the calendar of the church as well and and the forms of the church and that was we had not been a part of that so it was important to us that we that we moved through that process and so the following we we went on my mom was furious she didn't speak to me very often because when she did she would yell a lot and so she just withdrew and the following january after we came into the church my Dad found out he needed a transplant. He was 59. Mm -hmm. And 10 days later, we found out my mom had a brain tumor and it was oh, terminal. Wow. wow. And so all of a sudden, my otherwise healthy parents and my mom, who was not speaking to me, moved into our house and we took care of them. Yeah. And when you think you have forever to work something out, you um, take your time. <laughs> and when you realize you have six months to figure it out, a lot of healing can happen in a, in a short amount of time. And, and I thank God for the grace of conversion because before that we had no place for suffering, or at least not in the same hmm. way. You had platitudes for oh. suffering, but you did not have, you didn't have a real means of taking on suffering. And so we began to offer those sufferings up and, hmm. and to connect those with the cross of Christ. Hmm. And throughout that process of taking care of my parents, uh, we got closer towards the end of my mom's life. And a few weeks before she died, I was laying down chatting with her and she said, well, I have something to tell you. I can see that you're experiencing Christ in the Catholic church. Which I thought was, a, that was a long way for my mom to come. And I was so yeah. grateful for, for that. And and then she gave me a sly smile and said, I just don't know why God would do that. <laughs> <laughs> and yet for someone who doesn't just say things, it said a lot. Um, she, she understood that Christ, we were experiencing Christ in our life. And uh, the, then my dad died and three weeks later, my mom died. Wow. And, but in that, right before my mom died, my mom had grew up Catholic and she was confirmed. And we were brand new Catholics. I had never been to a Catholic funeral and I was planning my dad's. And the next um, 
few days when I knew my mom was close to the end, my husband said, I, I really think that we need to have your mom anointed, but I don't know if that's okay. So he talked to the priest and he said, the priest is coming over at this particular time. And I said, great, except the Baptist pastor is going to be here at the same time. God was good and staggered the visits, but he, the Baptist <laughs> pastor who had known my family for 20 years and who loved my parents and came and he couldn't read the scripture to my mom because she was unconscious. He prayed for her, but couldn't pray with her. And he had nothing to offer in that moment hmm. of, you know, of, of human experience, you know, that of death. And, and he left. And a few minutes later, the Catholic priest who had just come to the parish the week before, we didn't know him from anyone. And, and we knelt along around the bedside and the church had something to say when there's nothing to say hmm. and something to do when there's nothing to do. What? because otherwise it's just, they're going to a better place. Don't be sad, they're going to be with Jesus. And he thought, but there is a place for suffering, even Jesus wept. And it was so beautiful, and it was such a stark contrast in that moment, side by side, to experience that. And then as the, the following October, so a couple, another month later after my parents passed away, I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandpa asked if that RCIA thing was still going on. And I said, yeah, it, it is. And he said, I've never in my life needed something bigger than myself to deal with something. And with the loss of my son, I need something bigger than myself. Hmm. And my grandpa was baptized at 84 years old and came into the church. And, and you th it, was, it, was a, it was a beautiful experience to be together with my grandparents and my parents. And, and, to, and I thought back to my mom's devotion. She had a devotion to Our Lady as a kid and said the rosary had a little shrine in her closet. And I was thinking about it as I went on. I thought, all those now and at the hour of our death, now and at the hour mm -hmm. of our death, mm -hmm. and that my mom's childhood prayers could have had a peace in our conversion so that at the hour of our death, <laughs> she was close to the arms of the church. And then, as, and then that following December, we were at the Christmas Midnight Mass, and, and you celebrate this high feast of the incarnation of God, God coming to man and connecting with us. And the very next day, I was at daily Mass, and it's the feast of St. Stephen the Martyr. So you go from the high of the incarnation to the low of the first <laughs> martyr, and that's life, and that's conversion. These graces infused through, through the process of conversion, and this you know, these joy mixed with the sorrow, and yet neither are in vain. And even the calendar of the church speaks to the human heart and our experience with Christ. And it... You know, um, Scripture talks often about, uh, especially 2 Corinthians talks about, that we're comforted that we might comfort. We're comforted that we might comfort. And I think as you look back on your life, do you see ways in which the Lord had prepared you in unique ways for how you can comfort others now that you've come into the church. Absolutely, and and it, and it continues on, and we begin to see that the network of the family is is something much deeper than than we had even anticipated, and our faith intersects with every hmm. area of our life, and and there and that it doesn't matter if someone is hostile towards you. God calls us to love them, and He doesn't. Um, I, the parable of when my mom first found out she had a tumor, the readings about Lazarus and the rich man um, were at daily mass that particular day. And, and I was thinking over it and afterwards and praying, and, and I thought, we don't have to look far for the person that's outside our door. Mm -hmm. God provides them. And all we have to do is offer ourselves back to serve that person. And we know ourselves that often the person we throw out there is a, is a shield over what's really happening inside. So even all those years of your mother's antagonism mm -hmm. was covering up maybe what was really she was struggling with on the inside. Absolutely, and that, that connection with her own family and that, and, and how do you reconcile this real experience she had outside of the church. And as a Catholic, we have a place for that. Yeah. And, um, and, and thanks be to God, there, there were movements towards that. And, and so much of that timeline being sped up through her illness brought about the reconciliation of that relationship. G.K. Chesterton played a 
big part in opening your heart to the church. Did he continue to have a place? Absolutely. I um, am a nearly full-time volunteer of the <laughs> Chesterton Society, the Society for <laughs> Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Um, and his spirituality has been a huge part of my continuing on in my, in my I don't, lay spirituality, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but he continues to be my uh, jovial and genius guide through the life of the church. And um, recently, the Chesterton Society put out a book about conversions that were connected to Chesterton, and I had my story yeah. um, in that book. And Chesterton is such a, a great way to encounter the truth. He had an influence in C.S. Lewis's life, which is how I encountered him in the first place. It was mentioned in, uh, in C.S. Lewis's own conversion story that Chesterton was the first person who made Christianity make sense. Mm -hmm. And so he is a, was a great launching pad for, for me. And he explains things in, that you always knew, but never knew how to articulate. And, and he brings a way of saying things that you just couldn't say on your own, and yet are so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I spent a lot of time working with the Chesterton Society and um, trying to connect other people with them. I, I host a local society um, in our area as well and work to connect other people with Chesterton as well. As a Catholic mother and wife, um, looking at it through Catholic lenses, how do you look back on on your um, pregnancy, your first pregnancy? How do you look back on all that? As an absolute grace, we named our daughter Tori Grace because of all the graces that came during that <laughs> time. And, and as much of a picture of confession, it was a picture of the grace and the mercy of God. And the Catechism talks about in the beginning that the beginning of the knowledge of God is to understand where we stand in relation to Him. And I had always been a pretty good kid and hadn't had a real experience of that. <laughs> and it absolutely provided that for me, a um, um, humbling of, of my, of my, of me. And, but I look back and I think, what would my life have been without her? And she's in college now, and there isn't a day that goes by that you think, I wish she wasn't here. And it also gave me an understanding of that, kind of the temporal punishment for sin, and that I was forgiven obviously, and I carried her to term, and I, I raised her, and I loved her, and yet someday I would still have to tell her how she came about. And then she has to struggle with that sense that my parents didn't plan for me. Mm -hmm. And it was something I knew I would have to do, and yet there, those things kind of hang on, and, and help me to understand why do these effects of sins hang on even when we're forgiven? Yeah. Because all of our, our actions have consequences, and yet God works through all of those things to bring about healing in our life, in the lives of our kids, and the lives of the people around us. All right, excellent. We have an email, Sharon from Georgia. She writes, I am relatively a relatively new convert, and my husband and I have been wanting to know how to involve our young children in our faith and how to immerse them in Catholicism in a beautiful and appropriate way. We weren't raised in the church ourselves, so are starting from scratch, so to speak. What was worked, what worked well for Noel in creating a Catholic culture within the home? Well, first off, it's not exactly easy to find your way into a community inside the Catholic Church, uh, or at least inside the Mass, because it's not a fellowship, it's a sacrament. And um, so, but what I began to do is, is attend daily Mass. I brought my kids with me to daily Mass. I homeschooled, so that was easy to do. And I began to connect with other faithful believers that were daily communicants. And they were of all ages, but it helped me a lot because I didn't have a background with the saints. I didn't have a background with liturgical life in, inside the home. I just had no connection with that. And these people at Daily Mass were a huge help to me. And then connecting with Catholic homeschool materials that was, was very yeah. helpful because as I taught my kids, I learned. Yeah. And, and it was very helpful to me. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that Catholics have always done that newcomers, uh, you know, didn't have 
Catholicism 101 at some point in our life to know, you know, even rosary. I mean, how was that for you and your husband and Our Lady? That, that whole, it's not a part of your cat, your back. Absolutely. I mean, our first, um, we went to our first Mass, and that at, after Mass, someone invited us to a Catholic conference that was the following weekend. And we headed up to this um, parish nearby to go to um, this conference. So we had been to one Mass. And the following on Sunday and the following Friday, we showed up and I had no connection with the church. I didn't know how it worked. So um, I called them up ahead of time and told them where we were coming from. And they said, we'll make sure somebody meets you and, and we'll get you connected. So on Friday night, I had dinner with Tim Staples from Catholic Answers. <laughs> and, and well, just by chance? He was one of the speakers, and the people I had called had made sure that we uh, had um, <laughs> dinner with him you had when dinner we with arrived. a fire hydrant. Yes, you exactly. Know. <laughs> Drink from the fire hose. And yeah, so that was, um, so God just provides. And um, so we tripled the number of masses and said our first rosary that weekend. And we had never said the rosary, hadn't really looked far into it. My husband struggled a lot more with Mary than I did. I came to the authority of the church, and if that's what the church teaches about her, then well, I'm just going to figure it out, even if it's not easy. It was a, a lot more of a struggle for him. But that first rosary, and the first, at, in the beginning, my husband prayed the rosary with Psalm 23 on every bead. It took him a long time, but oh. he, could, he just yeah. couldn't bring himself to say the Hail Mary at first. But even just beginning, kind of a, a, a prayer of repetition that brings us into the presence of God was a new experience. And it helped him along the way and prayed for the grace to understand that as he went. What was the hardest barrier for you and your husband, if there was a really difficult barrier to get over? I mean, you had your family issues in that, but was there anything else, even within the church? Or, I mean, for you, confession was opened up because of yeah, your experience? And, yeah, and really once I crossed the the idea that the church was the church that Christ founded, you know, a lot of the other things fell in line fairly quickly. But I would say the isolation of coming into the church from a very close community before. We met with a priest when we when we were talking about joining RCIA. And I said, well, are there ways that we can get involved in the parish? And, he's, and I said, Bible studies, anything like that. And he said, no, not really. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's just completely, the Catholic Church just operates so differently. And, and now, like I said about, about your integrating it with your children, I would tell someone, come to daily Mass and begin to experience that and connect. There is a place to connect with people. They typically have a little bit more time. And we, um, we developed what the staff at our church calls our, um, con uh, our convert Protestant or Protestant convert parking lot ministry, <laughs> where we stand out in the parking lot and visit with people after Mass. <laughs> And, and to begin to kind of create some of those connections that, that all of us need and, and that the Mass isn't set up for because that's not what it is, but we still need it as, as human persons. And I would say that isolation was, was the largest thing. We lost all our friends and my family wasn't speaking to me yeah. and we were very alone at that time. And I also think that so much a part of your life were Bible studies Absolutely. And then you come into the church and they're just not readily available, which is sad because they should be. But And yet daily mass is a daily Bible study. Right. Okay. And that's why to me that was that was the connecting point because the daily mass became my Bible study. If you would, let's assume for a second that there's a Southern Baptist watching you right now. What would you like to say to that Southern Baptist about their, why they should also make the same journey you've made? Because you love the scripture and you love Christ and you love that he came and died for us and desires us to be close to him. And he offers that in a larger and fuller way without losing anything that you already have. You gain all that he left for us. And it's worth it because what isn't worth leaving for the sake of Christ? All right. Noel, thank you very thank you, much for joining us on the program, sharing your journey, our blessings on your husband. What was your husband's name? Stan. Stan, that's right, Stan. And uh, I have to get him on the show sometime to Absolutely. share his own journey and, and, of course, all your family. Thank you so much, and God bless you and your continued use, offering of your service to the church as you come into her presence. So thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do want to remind you again 
she almost opened the door for an infomercial because she talked about the, the struggle that people can have when they come into the church and connecting and having fellowship and knowing what to do, and especially if you want a Bible study or something and that's not available in the local parish. chnetwork.org is our website, but the Coming Home Network, its, its goal is to stand beside people on the journey, both on your way in and then when you've arrived and as you've continued in the church. The Coming Home Network wants to stand beside you to help you understand what God is calling you to do and how God is calling you to continue to use your gifts. You want to find out more about our work, please go to our website, chnetwork.org. So God bless you. See you again next week.